Greetings from Southern California. My name is Dr. Emily Letran, and it is my absolute honor to host another of our wonderful partner for uh, Global Summits Institute. I am the Dean of the Doctorate of Healthcare Business Programs. I would love to uh, invite all of our listeners, our attendees to take a look and join our program. It's a, it's a three-tier program teaching doctors of healthcare business, how to run the business of healthcare business. Uh, this program is gonna fill up that gap between being uh, a clinical expertise to being a savvy business owner. Um, it has three tracks. It focuses on finance, business, and research. And it will give you that edge to be able to run your business better and open doors to a lot of opportunities. This morning, it is my absolute honor to welcome Dr. Stephen Nugent to our podinar. Dr. Nugent has more than 40 years of experience in the area of integrative medicine. He's currently the chairman of the Global Scientific Advisory Board and is a speaker on science and integrative medicine. You know, his patients came from all over the world to his clinic which also serve as a teaching center for integrative medicine. He has tested more than 6,000 dietary supplement products and formulated more than 160. He taught and he created and he taught category one continuing medical education courses and has been teaching doctors for more than 30 years. And this is great because now we get a chance to listen to him in our short partner here, and I'm sure he's gonna give us a lot of resources after that. Dr. Nugent is the author of um, five books and the co-author of two. You know, those are published in five languages. He also has podcasts and blogs. He has earned multiple degrees graduating with top honors from undergrad and graduate levels. Its areas of studies include, but are not limited to, health and wellness psychology, integrative medicine, leadership psychology, organizational psychology, nutrition science, and business administration. Dr. Nugent has served as president of the International Association of Complementary Medicine and is a president emeritus of the American Naturopathic Medical Association. Dr. Nugent, such an honor and welcome to our party now this morning. Oh, it's, it's my honor, doctor. I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to educate your members. Well, you know, I, um, I know that you have a very, very long journey and is still ongoing, uh, researching, teaching, and serving. And so I just want to kind of start from the beginning. Um, what has, what changed for you that inspired you to go from being a clinician uh, treating patients, and I know your patients were coming from all over the world to see you, into doing um, something along the line of what you're doing right now, which is researching and, and formulation of supplements and working with companies to, to really impact a lot more lives than the patients that you locally see. Well, it, it, it was uh, kind of about numbers and technology, doctor. Uh, the, the numbers side of it was how many people can I help each day as a practitioner? And even though my integrative medicine center, I had two medical doctors on my staff as well, there was only so many people that we could see per day. Yes. And when I found the technology that I'm about to speak about in this uh, webinar, um, I was so astounded by the results with my patients that I felt ethically compelled to uh, go out there and teach as many people as I could about this technology, because I feel that this is foundational for virtually every aspect of human health. Yes, and, and do you have any, and I'm sure you do, I'm just, <laughs> um, any great stories, anything that really inspire you to where you think, you know, if I share this, I can change more lives. Was there, was there one of those turning points? Um, oh, gosh. Yeah. There, <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, there were, there were dozens of those in the beginning because 
Uh, I had a great life uh, at my clinic and making the decision to go from giving all of that up to doing what I've been doing for the last 27 years, uh, that was a big decision and, and, a, and a serious reduction in annual income for me. Uh, and, and of course, a reduction in freedom and an increase in work. So it was like, do you really want to do this? Uh, but uh, there were, I had a, a couple of patients in the first few months that I was testing the technology that we're going to talk about uh, that were in very, very serious health. Uh, and I mean, they really were in positions where there was no hope. All the physicians that they had seen were all saying the same thing. You know, it's, it's just a matter of time. I sort of out of desperation decided to try this new technology. And uh, I was astounded by the fact that these individuals not only began to recover, but eventually fully recovered. And, and it simply could, it wasn't possible. And, you know, this was back in the 1990s when we knew very, very little about the science I'm going to talk about today. And the, the medical doctors on my staff were like, you know, this, this is not possible. This couldn't happen. But it did happen. And, and then there was another case and another case and another case until it, it got to the point where I was beginning to feel guilty that I wasn't teaching this to people, that nobody knew about it. Even today, all these, you know, a quarter of a century later, uh, here I am educating your members because almost no doctor on the planet understands this stuff. So I just felt that I had to do this. That was my, that was my, uh, I mean, ethically, I was simply compelled and I had to do it. Yes. I, I think we, we call that those uh, callings, right? Yes. You're, you're doing certain things and all of a sudden you feel this calling that you got to do more. Um, when I started doing my coaching and consulting and helping people to grow their, their business, um, a lot of my friends would say, you know, we're pretty sure you don't need one more thing to do because, because <laughs> you, you got your multiple offices and, and you got your kids and you're very involved with, you know, whatever you're already doing. You don't need to be the one doing the traveling and, and you know, putting on events and hosting events. But when it's the calling, you know that it's right in your heart. That is right. And I really appreciate you sharing that because that's kind of part of what we do with this new program that we're launching, the Doctorate of Healthcare Business, is talking to people about what's beyond the, the clinical chair, right? For them, this is the chair, for doctors, it could be the bed or whatever it is. Um, what's beyond that operatory? Because what we know and what we can do to touch more life, sometimes we, we may or may not see it, but when we have somebody like you talking to us and sharing the experience and the knowledge, all of a sudden, it opens up the door. It's it, like light bulbs gone, go on and, and, and we think, oh, you know what? Maybe I can do something like Dr. Nugent. Maybe I can follow this particular path. And um, yeah, I would love to invite you to come on as a guest lecturer when, you know, in our curriculum and talk about being a researcher, um, you know, doing consulting, which is another venue, another avenue to not just grow your income, but make it feel more fulfilled. Yes. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, yeah, that would, that would be wonderful because that's, I'm always looking for, you know, whatever is beyond what we claim to be our scope of, <laughs> of expertise, oh. because your scope of expertise can always be broadened, right? That's right. That is correct. There's always more science. So when you, um, and I know you're going to be sharing this in your presentation, the, the, the science of it, um, the material that you're going to be sharing, how applicable would you say is it to all the different aspects of healthcare? So we, we, we have dentists, doctors, um, pharmacists, chiropractor, optometrists listening to this. And I know that it's going to be applicable to everyone. I, I just want your little little synopsis, um, how applicable would this be to us in, as a group? Well, and it, this is the reason, uh, doctor, that I like to use the words integrative medicine, because okay. what I'm going to talk about today is actually applicable to all the different disciplines in this group. 
Now, I'm not going to be able to cover in detail every aspect of that in this short presentation, but it is definitely applicable. Whether we're talking about uh, the oral microbiome, uh, that doesn't get talked about enough, really not enough, uh, or whether we're talking about the, uh, the gut-brain connection, uh, immune support, which is the most significant area of research in this technology, brain health, uh, memory improvement. Uh, I mean, the, the list goes on. So whether, I mean, even with pharmacists as an example, I teach pharmacists on a fairly regular basis. Uh, and uh, in fact, I did a, a, a lecture for a group of pharmacists in Spain who were confused about this technology because the information that their organization had given them and their training had given them was not fully inclusive. It, it didn't have all the data that they needed. So you make your decisions based on the information available. Exactly, if, yes. If you have incomplete information, your decision is not going to be accurate. Uh, so this was so this is important literally for everyone who's listening right now. The, for the, the the medical practitioners, that's obvious uh, how that's going to benefit them. Chiropractic practitioners will also benefit from this information significantly. So really, for every aspect of your membership, you've got uh, and and for the the PhD researchers who are part of your group. Oh, I just I appeal to all of them that we need more research in this area. It's exciting, it's productive, and it's so beneficial for human health. I just really want to encourage the PhDs to, if they've not done research in this area, please start doing some focus of your research in this area. It's so important. Yeah, well, I can feel the excitement in your, in your voice there. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to you so you can start your presentation. And then when you're, um, when you're done with the presentation, I will come back and we will do some Q&A. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Okay, let me get up my slides. Oops. Forgive me, folks. Uh, uh, Zoom is not my area of expertise. So <laughs> just get to where there we go. Okay, so this is meant today to be, as the title of this presentation uh, says, this is meant to be an introduction to the science and history of glycans. Really, we're talking about a very new area of science called nutritional glycobiology versus glycobiology. And glycobiology research goes back some, some distance in time but nutritional glycobiology, and that is the application of glycans for human health. And by the way, there are new studies uh, on the application of glycans for animal health as well. But today we're gonna talk about humans. Uh, and so this is meant to be the 101 level course. It's not meant to be the 601 level course. I know all of you understand that. So I will give you the basics in the beginning of the history and science. We're gonna go very fast through that because this is a 45 minute time block. And, and I have not, by the way, uh, had the time to do a dry run through this. So I'm gonna be watching my time as best I can and hope that we, we meet your needs uh, time-wise. Um, after that, I'm gonna spend a little more, more detail on the functional aspects of glycan technology. But first of all, you need to have that foundation because the vast majority of practitioners globally, and I don't care what your discipline is, globally, know little or nothing about this technology. And then over the last two years, there's unfortunately been a lot of misinformation about glycans. And I know this from uh, recently, I did a lecture for a group of medical doctors uh, who were quite confused, they were misled by information given them about glycation versus glycosylation. I'll do a little bit about that as we continue. But the point is, we've got to start with the basics because most practitioners have no idea uh, what this is about. And more importantly, they have no idea the benefits for their patients and the benefits in virtually every field. The, uh, 
National Academy of Sciences in the United States in 2012, they had published uh, a document called Transforming Glycoscience. And this was an amazing uh, piece of research. Very, very complicated document, by the way, even for those who understand glycan technology. But I was very impressed with the document because one of the things it said that the author slash researcher said was, there is no aspect of human health which is not affected by glycans. Now that's a really big statement. And it's a big statement because most practitioners who are doing uh, various types of uh, natural health, I say that in air quotes, uh, they are focused on something that is important to them or something that they've studied. So they are proponents of various vitamins or they're proponents of certain herbals or certain homeopathics or whatever. But here I'm talking about a technology that is foundational for every aspect of human health. Folks, I mean every aspect of human health, from brain health to gut health to oral health to structural health to everything. So this is a super important foundation for you. And let's start in a very foundational way, looking at blood types. All right, most of you have probably seen blood type diagrams before. And as you're looking at this, you can see that the different blood types have something in common. Each blood type has the same uh, basis or the same foundation, but what makes each blood type different? What makes them different is their arrangement of glycans that are bound uh, to these molecules. And it is the glycans, just the glycans, that make the difference between the blood types. So this really is foundational stuff. Well, a lot of people don't understand what glycans are. We, we have confusion, not just among laymen, but we have confusion among, among scientists and healthcare practitioners. So glyconutrient is a commercial term that was coined by the scientist who discovered the uh, ACE Manin technology that I'll talk about in a few moments. Scientifically, it's correct to refer to these molecules as glycans, not glyconutrients, but you'll see information about glyconutrients, uh, glyconutrients globally. In fact, if you go to WebMD, it's a very popular website, they have used glyconutrients to identify this rather than glycans, which is fine. I guess they wanted to appeal to the general public. We know from scientific study that there are more than 200 different plant saccharides, which contribute in one way or another to either human health or animal health. But there's only a few of these plant saccharides, which are sweet and possibly dangerous to humans. So I'm referring primarily to disaccharides. So when we say plant saccharides, we're talking about plant sugars. You'll find scientific papers that use the term carbohydrates, which is a little too general for me. I like to be a lot more specific. Um, but saccharides obviously mean sugar. So the first thing people think about is, oh, sugar is bad for you. Well, disaccharide sugars are bad for you. And that's what we have uh, in table sugar as an example. It's certainly bad for dental health, but it's bad for all aspects of your health. Yet the body requires certain sugars to function. Literally every function of the body requires them. So we're not talking about disaccharide sugars here. We are talking about monosaccharides, polysaccharides, and oligosaccharides. And uh, so we'll get to all of those as we go along. We do know that uh, these technologies that we're talking about, we're going to talk about ACE Manin and various other healthful plant saccharides, health supporting plant saccharides. In human double blind placebo controlled blood study, we know for certain that these glycans that I'll be talking about do not raise blood sugar. So get that out of your mind right away. That's just not an issue. It's nothing we have to be concerned about. So a lot of people will say, well, I never heard of this before. There can't be any science on it. Well, in fact, the documentation of this our earliest written documents go back to Alexander the Great. Uh, now, 
I'll talk about a number of different glycans today, but we'll talk significantly about glycans that come from the aloe vera plant. And what he did is he had many wagons in his supply train as he was trying to conquer the known world that were filled with aloe plants. And when a soldier was wounded, the first thing they would do is break open some of the leaf of an aloe plant and apply it to the wound. And it did help the soldier's wounds to heal faster. So we've known about the wound healing aspect of aloe for a very long time, but it took quite a while to understand the real science here. So I want you to see that the scientific investigation goes back really all the way to 1857. And yes, that was not very sophisticated science, obviously, in 1857. But I just want you to see that the scientific interest goes back a long way. It's not just something that happened in 1996, as an example, okay? Now, I'm going to move through all, most of these pretty fast. I want you to note 1922, heparin. Now, heparin is extremely important, and I'll return to heparin in a few moments. For those of you uh, who are in that area of practice, you understand that heparin has saved who knows how many lives as an anticoagulant. And uh, that is a glucosoamine glycan. So very important. And we'll, we'll come back to heparin in a few moments. I want you also, and you'll see on these slides as I move forward, I'll keep track of how many published studies were uh, were available at certain levels of history. I want to call your attention to 1953. Two researchers were tasked with finding a way to help people that had been exposed to radiation burns, because in 1953, everyone was concerned about atomic war. And there, there were still scientists studying survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so what they did was they exposed laboratory rabbits to uh, a similar level of radiation that you might be exposed to as a human if you were on the periphery of that atomic explosion, obviously not in the center of it. Uh, and then in one group of rabbits, they applied fresh aloe. In the other group, they did not. The rabbits who got the fresh aloe had amazing, they had remarkable improvements in their radiation burn healing. Uh, and that uh, obviously opened the door for more research in that area. But understand that no one knew, no scientist knew yet, what it, is it in aloe that does the healing? Everybody thought it was a protein. That's what all the scientists thought. And when the discovery was finally made, everybody was kind of shocked to find out that it was not a protein, but rather it was a plant carbohydrate, a plant saccharide. So you may have heard about the uh, discovery of the glycocalyx that happened in 1970. And the glycocalyx functions by having uh, certain glycans, which are bound in, if you were to see it under a microscope, they almost look like hairy fibers that are in the center of, uh, of, your, uh, of your capillary. And so that regulates the blood flow. It's very important stuff. So even glycans are important there. I, I won't go into detail on that. The presentation's too compact for that. They started doing intravenous fucose testing back with uh, mammary tumors back in 1971. And they, they were doing this in rats. And they had tremendous response with these various cancers in rats. And of course, that opened the door for further study in the intravenous level, which uh, I'll come back to in a few moments. Heparin then in 1974, finally, it becomes approved as a pharmaceutical drug. And then of course, begins to save lives all over the planet and is still saving lives today. And at this point, there's more than a thousand published studies on PubMed on glycans. Now, by the time you get to the 1980s, you're at more than 4,000 published studies so we've got a big increase, but still there is no medical school that's teaching this, no osteopathic school that's teaching this. Nobody's teaching this information. So practitioners are simply unaware. In 1983, this was a major milestone 
because a scientist working for a pharmaceutical company, he was ordered by his CEO to find out what is it that in aloe, what is the, the molecule that makes aloe heal people? What is that molecule that improves immune response? We see it does, but we don't know how it does it. Well, he discovered that molecule uh, and referred to it as ACE manin. And then it was scientifically identified at that time as mannose from aloe, which has a molecular weight in excess of 1 million Daltons. I'll come back to that. That's important to note. What he saw was a dramatic response in immune response and healing response with the laboratory animals. So they went through the process of trying to establish it as a drug, and the FDA rejected it because even at 100% pure ace manin and water, the lab rats receiving nothing else, they couldn't establish toxicity at all. Zero, nothing. And of course, those of you involved in the pharmaceutical industry, you know that you have to be able to tell the FDA at what level can this become toxic, and they were not able to establish that. So then it had to be sold as a dietary supplement. So here this drug company starts selling a dietary supplement product, didn't do very well selling it because it was too darn complicated to explain. And you'll understand that as we move forward. So what they did was they created a wound gel. And it was called kerosene wound gel, hydro wound healing dressing. And this, for its time, was the most popular, most used wound gel by burn centers and trauma centers across the United States. Uh, it was a huge success. And this was made by capturing that active molecule, which was a plant saccharide, not a protein, which the researcher who discovered it was shocked because he thought he was looking for a protein. He, he will say himself that he discovered that it was a carbohydrate purely by accident. And sometimes that happens in science, purely by accident. So we knew about the healing and immune response of that, but there needed to be more research. So by 1985, one of the challenges was, how do these glycans actually work? How are they linked? Do they have to be linked to well, to what? To nitrogen? To, are they linked to oxygen? What are they linked to? So what they found out that N-linked or nitrogen-linked glycans, that was the key and the foundation, not just for the functions that they were looking for, for immune function, but literally for all functions, as I will address uh, in this presentation. So this got a lot of interest then from some pretty serious scientists at some pretty powerful institutions, like Oxford as an example. And what we found out then by 1990, and again, you have, this was published in, in the biotechnology magazine, almost without exception, whenever two or more living cells interact in a specific way. So we're not talking about random function, but in a specific way, cell surface carbohydrates will be involved. It's foundational, my friends foundational to everything. By 1991, they were beginning to do injections on animals. So there was a veterinary application here. And probably most of you know that there's quite a few steps you have to go through to create uh, an approved injectable for animals. And this was being uh, applied to dogs and cats initially, uh, later to chickens. In fact, what they found was that when they made this into an injectable, it, it literally wiped out an epidemic of a particular virus that was killing billions of chickens at the time. Now, again, nothing had been done in humans up to this date. Well, what we then found out, we're starting to do research now with the, again, the N-linked, so make sure that we're not talking about O-linked, but rather N-linked glycans. And these N-linked glycans were actually very powerful for immune support in humans as well. Many more publications here, I won't read each of these, you can see them all yourself. <clears throat> One of them that's key is Harper's Biochemistry, 1996. The author of that section of Harper's that talked about uh, the identification of the glycans necessary for cellular communication and how it worked, 
Uh, his, his name is Dr. Robert Murray, very old and dear friend of mine. Brilliant, brilliant scientist, really brilliant. He's retired now. Uh, but he wrote about this and that discovery then prompted another scientist to create the world's first and to this day, the world's only plant-based complex that's specifically designed for cellular communication. Now, I'll come back to cellular communication and why that's important. For a lot of people, uh, they'll say, well, that doesn't sound very sexy. If you understand biology, you know that nothing works without communication, nothing. And the more accurate your cellular communication is, the more accurate your body can respond to a challenge. I don't care what the challenge is. And I'll be able to show you some science on that in a few moments. So now some research goes out there, uh, which was done by Corner and, and his group, because in medical school, even today, still today, in medical school, they are still teaching that you don't need to supplement glycans because all the glycans you need will be converted by your body always from glucose. Well, we know from human scientific study that at least 13 congenital disorders of glycosylation, it doesn't matter what you're eating, these individuals cannot properly take their glycans and have them bind with their corresponding protein and have them bind to the receptor site that they are very specifically programmed to bind to. And it doesn't happen. So at least 13 diseases have been studied. And to my knowledge, there's been no further study in that area uh, because it was 13 out of 13. It was 100%. Where well, these individuals were simply not able to glycosylate their receptor sites and therefore had different various diseases. And then of course that was referred to as congenital because obviously they were born with this genetic abnormality. What's interesting however, is one scientist did a study on uh, two of these abnormalities and found that when he gave glycans in a essentially pre-digested form, that he was able to get a significant health response. I think that's extremely important for everyone who's watching right now, extremely important. Well, in 1998, the first patent was issued for this particular uh, complex. And remember the complex was designed for cellular communication with the theory that if your immune system co uh, corresponds cell to cell effectively and accurately, your immune system will do what it was designed to do. And that is respond to an immune challenge. That was the idea. So cellular communication was the key for this scientist who created that formula. I wish I had uh, been among that group, but I, I wasn't, okay? Uh, we also know that there is so much new science here that a lot of scientists now simply refer to these glycans as a a new class of nutrient, like vitamins, minerals, etc. a new class of nutrient that deserves its own study. Well, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Human Genome Project and the proteome studies. Well, there is now glycome studies going on. The idea, and this was done by Japanese scientists, it is ongoing in Japan, and these Japanese scientists want to understand the entire human glycome. What do all of the glycans do? How do they do it? When and where and all that. So that's huge that this study is going on and, and we're learning a lot from that as well. Then we started to see really big grants coming out for research. Finally, thank goodness, some big grants coming out. $34 million to study glycobiology in 2001. There was another big grant from NIH. That was another 34 million that was uh, put out for cell-to-cell -cell communication mm -hmm. studies, cellular communication studies, also in 2001. So we begin to see a lot more very serious study that has to go on and has led us to uh, where we're at today. As we move forward here, uh, we're seeing now behavioral studies, because I said that this affects everything in the body. Brain health is positively, definitely, 
Absolutely. And I hate, as a scientist, I hate to speak in absolutes, but I must say that these glycans absolutely do affect brain health in a very, very positive way. I'll give you more on that in a few moments. But the first brain study was done in 2002. It was on brain waves, and there was definitely a positive effect on brain waves and oral ingestion of these plant glycans. Uh, then as we move forward, we see some more things going on here in 2004. The Scientist magazine, it says that uh, finally, Nutritional glycobiology is real science. It's finally reached the omic uh, level. So it's glycomics, right? We had a, a, a study, a very, very interesting study done in 2005. Uh, this was done by an Australian neuropsychologist, Dr. Talitha Best, another friend of mine uh, in this uh, area of research. Brilliant scientist. She really is amazing. And she was doing studies on cognitive health and memory. One of the things that she found out in a human, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized, etc., what she found out was that memory could be improved where she could verify it through neuropsych testing in a single day with only four grams of uh, this plant-based uh, technology. That is astounding. Because right now you've got such a huge population, anyone who's reached the age of 50, well, their memory is going to begin that slow, steady decline. And here I'm not talking about a disease, I'm talking about the normal decline. And we know that these plant glycans can in fact improve that. Uh, moving forward in time, uh, looking more at the way we are processing now, more studies on the processing of how can you improve these glycans through better science, better laboratory techniques, better processing techniques, uh, with obviously without harming the molecules in any way. We know also, based on a 2010 study, and there have now been subsequent studies, these glycans have a very positive effect as a prebiotic. So in case any of you don't know, a prebiotic is the food that a probiotic must consume to be healthy and multiply. What they saw was an increase in the, uh, the colony forming units of the probiotic uh, significantly simply by orally providing an oral administration in human patients and this was obviously very, very significant stuff. There's been follow-ups on this as well. Dr. Best does another study on uh, cognition and memory back in uh, 2010. And she finds that improvements in cognitive function, uh, attention uh, span, uh, depression improves uh, unipolar, not bipolar. Uh, she saw uh, improvements in um, focus, mental focus, etc. So very, very important stuff. And then also in 2010, another study comes out. This is actually a literature review of studies on immunomodulation. Now, many people are in, in healthcare think about immune stimulation. The public thinks about it that way. The media thinks about it that way. But I want you to think about immune modulation because we want to achieve immune balance. We neither want to stimulate nor suppress. We want balance in the immune system. So when I use the term immunomodulation, that's what I'm talking about. These glycans have now been shown in multiple studies to achieve immune modulation, immune balance. So this is particularly important for people with autoimmune disease to bring that that immune system down to normal, and obviously for people with weak immune systems to bring it up to normal. So that's immune modulation. So now we're almost 23,000 studies by 2010, and still nobody knows anything about it worldwide. I'm still lecturing to audiences that are completely unaware of the information that I'm lecturing uh, with them about. More studies on brain health is done, we then have another study on immunomodulation done in 2020, very strong study on immunomodulation and what we call cellular adversity. Uh, in the United States, and I know not everyone 
viewing right now is in the United States, but we have to follow US rules and law. In the United States, uh, dietary supplement companies are no longer permitted to use the word inflammation. So uh, in this study, the research scientists saw significant reductions in inflammation, but published it as cellular adversity. So you'll, you'll know uh, what that means, okay? And keeping in mind, of course, that this talk is for healthcare practitioners. This talk is not done uh, commercially or as a sales talk. This is a science talk, so we can talk real science. A reminder again, most foundational from the very beginning. Now, how is this working? All the cells have cell surface receptor sites, which really aren't receptors, they're transceivers really, because they both receive and transmit signals. But every cell has to talk to corresponding cells in order to function. If they cannot accurately communicate, your function will not be accurate either. So you might think about uh, these receptor sites as cell phone towers. When I'm talking to lay audiences, so no scientists involved, just a layman that we're talking to. I always use a cell phone tower analogy because the average person, as soon as I show them this picture and talk about cell surface receptor sites, they just sort of go blank. So think about them as cell phone towers. A cell phone tower has to be constructed in a particular way and has to be powered, obviously. The tower is powered in, in the case of the human body by vitamins and minerals but it has to have glycoproteins attached in very specific places. This is not random. This is very specific. It is by design. It is, these are predetermined pathways. That is what glycosylation is versus glycation, which is fully random. That's a totally different thing. And I don't have time to go through that in detail uh, in this talk. So literally every function of the body, I don't care what the function is, every function of the body is going to be dependent on this communication between cells, and that will depend on healthy cell phone towers or receptor sites having all of the glycoproteins that they are supposed to have, which in the glycoprotein is a protein bound to one of eight glycans. And when, they're, when they make that, that combination, that bond, now they can do certain letters of the cellular alphabet is the best way to say it. So you need all eight to complete all the letters of the cellular alphabet and have complete sentences and complete and accurate communication. So again, as I mentioned, more than 200 plant saccharides are known at this time. The two most notable, as far as I'm concerned, are ace manin and arabinogalactan. Arabinogalactan comes from both the Western and Eastern larch tree that grows in North America. It comes from the bark. And this is, has tremendous immunomodulatory properties, just tremendous. In one particular human double-blind placebo control study, it was shown to support the body's response to influenza vaccine and pneumonia vaccines. It attenuated the response. It improved the results of those people vaccinated. And those people who were vaccinated and also received these glycans from arabinogalactan, what they were also having it was a much lower rate of adverse responses to the vaccines. Now, this talks about immunomodulation, helping to get that immune response balanced out. Now, right, let's talk about ace manin. Now, ace manin is something that every company that sells aloe claims to have ace manin. And as a researcher, it's kind of infuriating to me how marketing people do this kind of stuff, but, but it, it happens. All right. So the scientific definition is going to be mannose from aloe, which has an, a molecular weight of between one and two million Daltons. Now the technology has gotten so sophisticated that true ace manin is exceeding 2 million Daltons, pretty much standard. Um, contrast this with ordinary mannose from aloe. Now mannose from aloe, typical standard average is gonna be around 360,000 Daltons. 
Some aloe, very, very poor quality aloe, may be as low as 200,000 Daltons molecular weight. And there are some that go up to 400,000 uh, Daltons molecular weight. But only true ace manin will be in excess of 1 million Daltons. Now, I want you to hang on to that idea because it's important. That molecular weight is important because that talks about structure. Now, all of you know that function is, is key based on the structure. So the structure will, in large part, determine the function. What I want you to see is that true ace manin, you see the molecular structure on the screen versus manos from aloe. So manos from aloe, which has not been properly uh, processed, you see the structure is different. Now, the structure is different. That means the function is different. And I just want you to understand that. I don't expect you to remember the formulas. So true ace manin, it takes 660 kilograms or around 1500 pounds of aloe leaf to make one kilo, approximately 2.27 pounds of ace manin. So it's not all these other aloe products out there, these, these other aloe products, which are not ace manin, and most of them calling themselves ace manin anyway, are just lots of aloe gel. And some of them, I'll call your attention to the cutaway on the side of the screen of the aloe leaf. Now you'll see the outer leaf, obviously, but between the gel, the mostly clear gel, and the leaf, there is this, this uh, green area, which is that's called aloe latex. Now, if you hand fillet the aloe, you don't have the latex mixed, but most companies do it by machine. And very often there will be aloe latex in their aloe product that they are uh, inaccurately calling ace manic. So we know then from scientific study that this supports cellular communication. There's no question about that. This has been studied, it has been verified, and this is through N-linked or nitrogen-linked glycans, all right? Scientifically, we know that it's also linked to improvements in cellular metabolism, not just in immune response and something else that came up in a different study that I found fascinating. Obviously, if you, if you really work this out from the foundation up, then it would be obvious that if you improve cellular communication, you should see logically an improvement in virtually every aspect of function in the body, logically. Well, one thing that was uh, noted in one particular digestive study was that when ace manin was given orally to humans, it improved the absorption of certain vitamins like vitamin C, vitamin E, Everybody's talking about the importance of vitamin C uh, these days and you know, probably will forever, I imagine, because it is so important. But improving the absorption. So digestion is one thing, absorption is another. What I say in my lectures on human digestion is that you are not what you eat, you are what you digest. If you don't digest it, it doesn't matter if you ate it. It just, it's an expensive bowel movement. So this is important to note that when this is given orally, the ACE band is given orally, that it actually does improve the absorption of various key vitamins. Now, the study was not done to check for every type of nutrient, vitamin, mineral, etc. We just know about certain key nutrients that were studied because in science, you try not to make assumptions. We want to have real evidence of what's going on. Let's go to another area which I find very, very fascinating. And this was very new to me initially, something I hadn't thought about. When people think about aloe, they're thinking about the aloe gel, they're thinking about the mannose, they may be thinking about other uh, glycans which are also present in aloe gel. But what they typically don't think about is the aloe pectin. So what you're seeing right now is a cutaway uh, of a, a microscopic look at what the pulp slices look like. Now, I call your attention to these wall structures. Those are made of pectin. 
Now, of course, most of you are probably familiar with the idea of using pectin, let's say from uh, apples, apple peel, that kind of thing. Uh, because uh, if, you, if you look at fruits, for instance, if you're going to take a, uh, uh, an orange, let's say, you peel the orange, you open it up, you look at it under a bright light, and you will see strands of fiber on this. Now, these strands of fiber, if you were to open them up, they would have strings of pectin inside of them. And pectin, by the way, is a long chain uh, saccharide. So that's important stuff. So we're still talking about the same, we're still talking about saccharide technology, plant saccharide technology, but now we're looking at it from a different level. So I've been focused on mannose and on rabinogalactan, but what I want you to know now is that the pectin has another benefit, sort of a an unsung hero, an unknown benefit to most people. What we know from scientific study is that the heavier the molecular weight of pectin, the more effective it is in assisting your body in removing chemical toxins. My friends, there are so many chemical toxins on planet Earth right now. One of the books that I wrote years ago was all about toxins in the environment. And what we know is that there are tens of thousands of chemical toxins in our air, in our water, unfortunately, in the food chain. Uh, and the human body is exposed to these toxins all the time. You want to do something that can help your patients detoxify these chemicals. It's extremely important. So again, the heavier this pectin is, the more effective it will be in helping your body to detoxify chemicals. So it's a whole different advantage here. So if you look at this diagram, what you see is that internally, you have mannose and galactose that are in significant levels, but especially mannose, very high uh, in the, the pulp itself. But the cell wall that contains the pectin, this is about 90% galacturonic acid. That's important because it's galacturonic acid that binds to chemicals to help remove it from your body. And so the cell wall of the pectin is about 90% galacturonic acid. This is huge. And the heaviest allopectin that is known to science today is found in true ace manin. Now, as the other aloes products are lower in molecular weight, their pectin is also lower in molecular weight. So again, the heavier it is, the more effective it's going to be to help detoxify chemicals from your body. So we also know that we have a lot of exposure, humans all over the planet, I don't care where you live, a lot of exposure to toxic heavy metals. We know that this pectin can also help to remove both plus two and plus three heavy metals from the body. All right, put that in simpler terms. We can help to detoxify lead and cadmium uh, and, and things like that from the body. Very, very important stuff. So this binding that goes on with the galacturonic acid is huge. And the more of it you have, the better. And the heavier that pectin is, the better. All right, next step. We know that both the mannose and the pectin function as prebiotics. We know this from separate scientific studies. And then what we know from this is that the prebiotic, which of course nourishes the probiotic, and the probiotic is key to having a healthy gut microbiome. But what you may not know, and by the way, I didn't know until yesterday that your uh, organization was uh, initially founded by a dentist and has many dentists in it. I know Dr. Latran, of course. But so she asked me yesterday, can you put some information about uh, dental health in here, which I didn't quite have time to do what I wanted to do to, to give you all the proper research. But I can tell you, there's some very significant research in the area of oral microbiome. And practitioners all over the world, and of course, the media and laymen, 
they're hearing the term gut microbiome, and it's being heavily, heavily discussed. But you have a gut microbiome, you have an oral microbiome, you have a skin microbiome, and all of these have important functions for your health. The oral microbiome, I read through some studies yesterday, which were new to me because I hadn't been asked to do any research in the dental area before. And I was very surprised to find out that certain probiotics actually have been shown to improve oral health and shown to improve cases of periodontal disease. This was fascinating to me. In fact, I mentioned to Dr. Latran that I'm, I'm going to put together a presentation on this for dentists uh, because I think it's extremely important for them to know this information. So I don't want you to be pigeonholed because I know you have practitioners in this organization from all over the spectrum of practice. And yes, dentists are licensed to deal with things in the mouth, but you need to understand, all the dentists need to understand that dental health is much more than just uh, the things that you've been taught in dental school. It's about certain vitamins and certain minerals, the minerals you knew about, but it's about certain vitamins. And it is about glycans. The glycans and the probiotics are contributing significantly in this area. We also know about wound healing and of course growth factor uh, that has been improved in various studies uh, by the presence of glycans. Pretty darn exciting stuff. So I wanna backtrack just a little bit for you. When we talked about immunomodulation, we had studies before the, the laws changed. Uh, the, the laws have been changing a lot, not just in the United States, but around the world. And in the United States, the laws now are such where if a dietary supplement company wants to talk about their product, the sale of their product, they cannot do that and also talk about the true known science about that product. They have to use terminology that often leaves the public confused. They can't reveal the full science that they know about the function because, well, the government will just come down on them for they, they just can't do it. The idea from the government's perspective is then it becomes a drug claim and it's not a nutrition product anymore. So with this in mind, studies that, that I am very aware of that are still in my intracranial cargo, as I like to call it, um, these were studies initially, we go back uh, to the, uh, 19, the early 1990s, and there were studies done with true ACE Manon that showed that patients, as an example, one study with uh, patients with HIV AIDS, it was a 63% positive response in their immune function. And they were doing, of course, everything else they could do naturally. But there was a very powerful response to uh, individuals with this particular virus. We know, and there are many studies now and more studies coming out all the time about viral response and the involvement of N-linked glycans. O-linked glycans might make things worse, but N-linked glycans um, with viral response. Uh, when you know, Dr. Latran asked me in the beginning about uh, patients that inspired me to make the change and just go from practice to teaching globally. And these were, it started with patients who had terminal cancer. And these patients did recover these, in, these first few patients I talked about and should not have. Now, it wasn't because I had given them a new drug. It's not a drug. It wasn't even because the ACE Manin is medicinal. It's not medicinal. What it does is it improves cellular communication so that you have the optimal possibility of optimal immune response. That's what it does. And that's what fascinated me in my studies early on is that I was seeing, and the doctors on my staff were seeing, a, an improvement of people with so many different health problems 
in so many different areas, we all said, this is impossible. It can't happen. Yet it did happen. It was possible because it happened. So cellular communication is foundational. That's been proven by scientific study. Cellular metabolism, immune modulation, improvement in brain function and memory support, digestive function in terms of not just improvement of your uh, microbiome, but also improvement of digestion and absorption, all of these things. So after thousands of years of talking about, first was aloe, but now it's been many glycans. In fact, I typically recommend glycans from four different plant sources, not just aloe. And I talked about arabinoblactin as the second plant source earlier. Now we know these things. So before I turn this back over to Dr. Latran, I apologize, I'm a couple of minutes over time, but I want to invite all of you. I have a free generic website. There are no fees. I sell nothing. I make no profit. This is purely education. This is something I need to do to educate people. And your information, if you register as a subscriber, your information will not be captured and sold to somebody else will not. It's going to be completely private and only kept at drnugent.com. And of course, uh, this, uh, my I have podcasts and blogs, they are um, transcribed and then translated into Chinese, Korean, and Spanish. You also see here various links for my podcasts and so on at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. You just do at the Nugent Report. Very soon, in the next couple of weeks, we will have our new Nugent Report YouTube channel as well.